Hello, I would like to welcome everyone to the IBM Watson Health Executive Webinar Series. Today's presentation is titled, A Brief on Lean Fundamentals for Healthcare, presented by Jerry Green, VP of Applied Quality at IBM Watson Health. Before we begin, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. First, you have a control panel on the right hand of your screen. You can minimize and expand this panel by clicking on the arrow in the upper right corner. Second, you can submit questions using the question panel located near the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of this presentation. Finally, all registrants will receive a copy of this presentation and a link to the recording within two business days after the webinar. The information will be sent to your email in which you registered with. At this time, I will turn it over to Jerry. Jerry, the floor is yours. Again, welcome to a brief on Lean Fundamentals for Healthcare webinar. I'm Jerry Green. A little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working in process improvement methodologies now for about 17 years, working with you know Lean, Six Sigma, PDCA, A3, Rimmler Break, and, and others. Uh, this workshop, however, focuses um, solely on Lean, and I believe that Lean is the best approach uh, for healthcare. So first, before we get started, I want to level set what is Lean. So lean is cycle time reduction through waste elimination. So when your process that you want to improve, when time is the issue, lean is the methodology that you would follow. A lean organization produces what is needed and only when it is needed with the minimum amount of resources required. A lean organization also requires that employees are empowered to remove non-value-added activities uh, when they account for them. So it will not work in a command and control type of organization. So one of the things that we teach is always lean first. As we stated, there's many methodologies out there that you can choose from. Always lean first. The reason you want to do that, you don't want your organization spending time and effort trying to improve an activity or a process that could have been eliminated, automated, or significantly simplified. Another thing about Lean is it can be deployed within other frameworks real easily. So the agenda we're going to go through today is one, we're going to explain why is Lean important to healthcare. We're going to go through the five Lean steps and tools, starting with defining value, mapping the value stream, eliminating the waste, implementing the solution and pulling value, and then maintaining the gain and pursuing perfection. We'll have a conclusion, and then we'll open it up for questions. So the five-step lean process, again, it works very well with other frameworks. If you look at the right, there's the traditional Six Sigma framework called DMAIC, Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control. I've also listed out PDCA. A lot of people use PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, or Plan, Do, Study, Act, either one of those. It works real, real well within that framework. The most important thing to remember about Lean, though, is you have to follow these five steps in this particular order, regardless of how you've mapped it within a framework. Okay? The first step, you're going to define value from the customer's perspective. In this uh, webinar, we're going to change that to patient, but the customer is anybody who is receiving the output of what you are producing. Second, you want to map the value stream and identify issues and constraints, and those are anything that impedes what the customer wants from step one. Step three, eliminate the waste and allow the customer to, pull, to flow through the value stream without interruption. Step number four, implement the solution and let the customer pull value through the workflow. And then five, maintain the gain and pursue perfection. Again, for this webinar, the customer is the patient. So why is lean important to healthcare? So these three bubbles are interrelated. If any one of these bubbles change, it's imperative that you change the other two. The technology bubble tends to be the most disruptive of all three of those. So when we have a new technology or a system changes, it becomes obvious that we need to train people so they can gain new knowledge, skills, and abilities to work within with that new technology. However, a lot of times the process piece is forgotten. When the process is not realigned to new technology, what happens is people find workarounds and other ways to make it happen. A lot of times you have best practices that are hidden in tribal knowledge. 
You have some things that are not best practices that are going on, activities that were value add before the technology are no longer value add today, but they still continue. So it's very important as you change and as you go forward that you continue to look at your processes from a lean perspective and align it to your, to your technology. So here's an example of a map that was leaned out in one of our workshops. The end goal in this map was to have an uninterrupted flow for the patient. Okay? If you would have seen the map before, it was a quagmire. There were places in the map where the patient slowed. There were rework, rework loops. Uh, there were things happening downstream because of something upstream that causes the patient to stop and wait. This particular flow allowed the patient to flow through without interruption. There was more work done up front to ensure that downstream problems didn't occur. There was also things done in parallel that you can see. But that's the end result. This is what you want. You want a map when you're done that will allow you to go into your organization and lean it out so that the customer, in this case the patient, doesn't slow down during the workflow. One of the key concepts in Lean is transparency. It's critical. You have to make things transparent. It helps first create a sense of urgency and also ensures that the process improvement team focuses on the right area of the map. Too many times in my career I've seen people go work on something, make an improvement, and then nothing really changed as far as the outcomes go. So transparency will help get everybody on the same page as well as evoke an emotional response to get that sense of urgency. We do hold uh, web uh, workshops from time to time, uh, and this is some client feedback from the Lean workshops I thought I would share. I'm not going to go through all these items. I'll let you read through that for, for a few seconds. Oh, these are a few things that um, clients have brought into our workshops that they've, they've worked on and given us some feedback on. So I'll give you a few seconds to read through this, maybe spark some ideas uh, among yourselves. Okay, step one, define value from the patient's perspective. Again, as stated earlier, very important, you have to follow these steps in this particular order for lean to be effective. Step one, define value from the patient's perspective. First, always start with a charter. We teach from a PMI perspective, Project Management Institute, no charter, no project. The charter releases the approved resources and the funding to continue. And it gets to go ahead to pull people together off the, the line in order to work on this improvement. It also helps control scope creep. Keep in mind that your charter is a living document. It will be progressively elaborated. So you don't have to have a 20-page document to start. I highly recommend against that. Your charter should be one page. We do it on paper at first, like you see this example of a charter. right? Now, although you don't want to put a lot of information in it, there are some things that you have to have to start. One, you have to have the definition of the problem to solve. If you don't have a definition, no one's going to be on the same page. You've got to iron that out make sure everybody agrees on the definition to solve the problem. You need to know who the champion is. Recommended that the champion is one level higher than the process owners of the value stream that you're going to be working in. You need a project leader to find, probably the person holding the meeting, filling out the charter. And you also need a project team. You may not know everybody who's going to be on the core team but you need to have an idea of where they're going to come from. And then scope, you need to know what's included and excluded. That's the boundaries. So you need to know what clinics are included, which ones are excluded, which hospitals are included, what's excluded, what tower. Those things are very important. And then goals are important as well. And also I would recommend having schedule on here. If you have an idea of the champion's time frame, I would capture that as well. Again, don't spend too much time making a 20-page document. Keep it to one page to start with. and then. Let it grow as your project uh, continues. The next thing you want to do is you want to define the voice of your customer. Who is the customer first? Because you can have multiple customers for the same process improvement. You're going to have one primary customer in this case. We're talking about the patient. You can have internal customers as well. You can have finance. could be you know, the provider. It could be nurses. You're going to have internal customers. We call those the voice of the business. You need to know what they want 
what they care about. And you're going to find that although customers have many care abouts, there's usually one, two, or three three that are distinguished as the most important. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then those are the ones you really want to capture. And then when does the customer need the output? We'll cover that in the waste and flow and uh, how you provide it to them. So overall, you really want to capture at this stage in step one what is important to those who are the recipients of your process. We use a brainstorming method called the five M's and P. This is what we teach in our workshops works very well. Every single input can follow into one of these items. So for example, people would not just be the patient, right? It could be the physicians, nurses, analysts, quality managers, and so on. Methods are things that processes that are in place that you follow. A machine, generally things like laptops, software is considered a machine, so your EMR would be a machine, programs, a vehicle would be a machine, routers, and et cetera. And the material are generally things that are um, disposable. Not necessarily so, but most of them are disposable. The desk wouldn't be, but most items are. And then measurement or anything that takes a measurement of anything. It could be an Excel spreadsheet if you're capturing something else, the Excel spreadsheet, or it could be from your EMR. It could be anything you're using to measure. It could be something physical like you know, a blood pressure device or lab scores and things like that. And then Mother Nature. Mother Nature it's generally thought to be like temperature, rain, uh, people can't park because you know it's icy outside, so you know um, that could affect you know the schedule that day. Those are important, but it's also things like policies, HIPAA, NCQA, things that are in place that your process improvement team is not going to be able to control, but they need to make sure they're aware of it so they can work around those those boundaries. So here's an example. Uh, from a 5 and a P that a team used to identify the customers. They actually broke them down into three areas. Uh, this is not etched in stone. You may find other ways to break yours out. I thought it was interesting and I would share it. So they broke it out as primary as the patient. And then they broke out secondary, which had families and you know individuals who were not the primary, but they were directly in touch with the primary. And then indirect, they had things like CMS, HIPAA, Immune, a lot of things that would have followed under the uh, policy, under the uh, Mother Nature area. So once we've done that, we know who the customers of the process are, and we know who the internal um, voice of the business uh, people are. We use a Kano model, and a Kano model is a really good methodology to make sure that you don't miss something in what the customers care about. It was developed by a guy named. Nariki uh, Kano in the 1980s. He actually used five areas, but we found it a little easier just to break it down into three major areas and think about it that way. Starts with the bottom, which are the basic needs, and those are the must-haves. What's important about the must-haves is that a customer does not think that they need to ask for it. They assume that you know it's going to be there. Okay. It's like going to a coffee shop. It can have a great ambiance. It can have Wi-Fi, a lot of cool things. But if you got your coffee and it was lukewarm and you wanted it hot, you would be unsatisfied. So basic needs, when met, you're not going to be oversatisfied. You're not going to be happy because your coffee was hot. But if you're not giving, you're given your basic needs, you will be dissatisfied. So it's imperative that you don't forget those must-have needs in your lean design. You don't want to eliminate something that would affect a basic need. The should have needs, those are the expected. The customer is specifically going to ask for that. You're going to know what it is because they're going to verbalize it and say, this is what I want. Okay? I want cream in my coffee. When I go to a coffee shop, I expect you to have cream there. Or I want certain things in it. You're going to go up to the counter and ask for those things. And then the wow factor, those are delighters. Those are things that you can put in your product or service that the customer doesn't know exists yet. It's going to wow them. You have to be careful. You do not want to sacrifice a basic need for a wow factor. So it's very important to remember that, or an expected need for a wow factor. Wow factors are the last thing. When you include it, you're going to have satisfied customers and be very delighted. If it's not there, they're not going to know to be not delighted. 
And keep in mind, over time, those wow factors eventually become, become basic needs once it becomes a commodity. So this is a nice way to brainstorm your, the needs and the voice of the customer to ensure that you're not forgetting something in your design. So here's an example of one, very simple example, that's why I used it here, that a team used, and you can see how they've listed basic, expected, and wow factors. Again, you don't want to trade one of the basic needs for the wow. Uh, it also reaffirms a lot of stuff you already knew, that you write it down and helps reaffirm it. Uh, and it, it's also a visual, it helps people look at it and say, okay, we know that this is, this is what we want to design in our process. Step number two. Map the value stream and identify issues and constraints. All right, when we do our mapping, what we teach, now that you've done your five M's and a P, and here's an example of a real one, we take that and put that on the wall next to where you're going to be mapping. Again, transparency is important, but it's also going to ensure that you don't forget something critical when you're looking at your mapping process. So you don't have to go back and map later. Another tool that we teach is called a SIPOC map. And what we recommend is either use the 5MNP or use a SIPOC. I recommend not using both. Uh, when to use a SIPOC would be when your process improvement team doesn't have a lot of knowledge about the subject that they're going to be working in. It's very helpful to think about it this way. For example, I know a nurse who was working in a clinic and she was asked to go work in a hospital in a sterilization area to help improve that process. This tool helped her and her team that she's bringing in understand it a little bit better. So it's really good when there's ambiguity. Start with the process, list what are the process steps, then list out what are the inputs to each of those process steps and then who supplies that. And a lot of times you may not know, your team's going to have to go find out who that is. But this helps spark that discovery phase. And then capture what are the outputs and then who are the customers of those. Again, we recommend use one or the other, the 5 m and or the SIPOC. Both are staple items in Lean. Um, but use one. Use this one if you have a process that's really ambiguous. Another key concept in Lean is to think horizontally and not vertically. In other words, don't think about mapping out just functional groups. You want to map out the entity end to end from its first touch point all the way to its last touch point. Okay? I'll give you an example. I like to use coffee shops because everybody understands that. Think about a coffee shop and for some reason customers are complaining because the coffee is tasting bad. Human nature would be, let's go map the brewing process. And so we would map it out, what's happening in the brewing process. But when you think about coffee, it's horizontal. It starts in the field and ends in the cup. Some people say it ends in the cup at the customer. So it would be field to customer or field to cup, either one of those. Right? But it's horizontal. It includes logistics. It includes beans, where they're grown. You may find that the reason the coffee is tasting bad is because the area that's making the coffee, the field, got too much rain last year. Or the freezer is getting too cold and it's drying the coffee out. Both of those are on either side of where the coffee is brewed. So you want to think about your value stream end to end. Think about the entity flowing through, not the workers. Think about the entity that's flowing through and you're going to map what happens to the entity. In this case, the entity we're talking about is the patient. All right, what is a process map? It's just a visual rep representation of a workflow. That's all it is. Okay, it demonstrates where a project starts, where it stops. It'll also include decisions, decision points, rework loops, and, and things like that. It's just a visual representation. Inputs, process, and outputs. Here are some of the standard process mapping symbols that we teach. There's a lot more. These are the main ones you're going to use 99% of the time. Start and stop are the ovals. We recommend color coding those because you'll find that when you look at a value stream, there could be many start points, not just one. Sometimes there's several. Same with stop. There could be many things that happen 
that cause the process to stop. And so you want to capture those by color coding. It's a little bit easier to see where things start and stop. Again, transparency and making it as a visual is important. Process steps are the little squares. If it's a very detailed process activity that could become its own map, you would use the one that has the lines on it right here. The diamond is decisions, arrows, transportation, storage and wait time, we use a little um, triangle, and then delay is the little is the D. A lot of confusion between the delay and the storage. Storage and wait time generally we use for supplies, things like that, and delay we use for the entity flowing through. And for delay, you want to capture what's the average time for that delay, right? If it's 20 minutes, then you'd want to put a 20 in the D or under the D so everyone can see that. Always map the current state in detail. Another thing we do in our workshops with our clients is we make sure they map in enough detail that if a process feels like a quagmire to the workers, it probably is, and it needs to be visualized on the map. So you want to detail map out your process so that it will invoke an emotional response and it's going to help identify where are the areas of these quagmires that we need to focus on first. Also very easy, you don't have to have a statistics background like you do in some of the tools that are used in Six Sigma, you just need sticky notes, white paper, project paper, flip charts, uh, and markers to do that. That's a very good visual that will help get buy-in for your project as well as focus the team on what to work on. Here's an example of a real functional value stream map at the top, the one with the sticky notes. You can see where there are red lines and some rework loops in that map. You can also see the quagmire, the main area, it's right here. You can see there's some things happening here and here. What I like about a value stream map is it not only shows you where the problems are, you can trace it back upstream to find out where is the cause, what happened upstream that caused this downstream problem. The electronic map below it, the one here, is exactly the same map. It was just put into an electronic format. You can, you can see the rework loops. Uh, we use cones. We teach that. So if issues come up during the mapping session, you want to capture it, we'll put a cone there and then a description at the bottom of what that caution was, what are some of the opportunities for improvement there. Next, what you want to do is you want to time out each activity and line in the map. Don't forget the lines, those are transportation and there can be time there as well, the arrows. So we want to time out each activity in the map. Now what really bakes the noodle and this took me a long time in my career to finally start to understand this. You can go into a process, a value stream. If you look at this one, the red is non-value add and the green is value add. If a process improvement team came in and removed all the red out of this map, you would probably have higher patient satisfaction because we're going to be in the clinic less time, right? less wait time, but your volume for that clinic is not going to change. It's 20. It's 20 a day. So regardless of what I do around that, if I don't do something to improve the constraint, I'm not going to incre increase the, the volume. This was a flaw that Eli Goldratt in the 80s identified in lean. It was a lean flaw. So when you map out, you want to time all the activities, everything that happens, so that later you're going to be able to identify where is your number one constraint and if I remove that constraint, how much time am I going to add to this process? How much more capacity? Okay, a few process mapping tips, tips and hints that um, my team has come up with over the years. We just started documenting them for our, for our workshops so we could leave that with people. I help you a lot. First, use mapping paper and sticky notes. Don't try to map electronically, right? Things change too much and during the mapping exercise and those lines fly all over the place when you're trying to do it in, the, in a mapping tool. Use it on paper. It engages the team. It gets them involved, gets them excited. Everybody's working uh, up on their feet. Involve subject matter experts or you will be remapping. Always map from the 
entity's perspective, not the workers, map what's happening to the entity that's flowing through. Even rework loops, wait points, all that, map it all out. Start and stop at extremes. Only one activity per sticky. Do not put swim lanes on your map to start with. Use sticky notes instead at the side. Those are functional groups that are working or where the handoffs occur. Write those on sticky notes, put them on the side. It's much easier. You can add the lines later if you want to put them on your paper map. For decisions, always show the percentage that goes down each path. Those are those diamonds. If you have two paths, one might be 70% of the time it goes this way, 30% it goes that way. Make sure you put that on your map. Again, it's a visual and it's for transparency. Do not have naked lines. Lines are transportation. Email is not an activity, it's a line. Label it as such. Label it email, face-to-face, -face, meeting, or however that information was, was transported. All right, now that you've timed your map out, you want to start doing what's called a value add flow analysis. And to do that, you have to determine for every activity, is it value add or not value add? The way to do that is to follow the lean criteria. And all the criteria must be true or the activity is non-value add. The first one is the patient must care about it. Clearly, if the patient doesn't care about it, you should question if it's value add or not. And the activity must change the patient or knowledge about the patient. And three, the activity must be done right the first time. Clearly, no one wants to pay extra for something because it had to be redone due to a mistake or an error. Those are the lean criteria. And again, all three have to be true or an activity would be considered non-value add. Another way to look at activities, sometimes teams struggle with the lean criteria. If an activity falls into one of these buckets in the Moodle wheel, referred to as the Moodle wheel, it would be non-value add. So if you're not sure, look at this and say, would it fit within one of these? So first, defects, and we use downtime as a way to remember. Defects are things like incorrect data entry, incomplete information, mistakes that resulted in rework or having to throw something out. Overproduction are preparing X reports that nobody reads, uh, making too much of something. Uh, waiting is batching work, storing a lot of work before moving to the next step. The downstream step or resources or workers not ready when the patient or the entity shows up. Unused creativity is like not working at the top of your license, passing something to somebody else that you could have done yourself. Uh, transportation, again, that's the lines on your map traveling to and from facilities, waiting, you know, walking to a copy machine. Inventory are things like purchasing supplies in bulk, storing in a cabinet. Uh, motion, very similar to transportation, but we teach it is motion is when you're in an area and you're moving and twisting a lot. For example, if you were in an exam room and you, you were moving from one cabinet to another, I would consider that motion. Transportation is more like you leave the area to go to a copy machine or something like that. And then finally, excess processing is kind of the catch-all. Things like multiple sign-offs, and you could have just had one. You have four people signing it off all the way up the chain. Uh, most meetings, downstream inspections, rework, unnecessary approvals. All right, so next you want to, now that you know how to evaluate whether an activity is value-add or non-value-add, you want to conduct what we call the value-added flow analysis. We use the red dot, green dot technique. That's what we teach. Have your subject matter experts come around the map and then label them either with a red dot or a green dot. Again, the red dot, or non-value add, has to follow all three criteria. The patient has to care about it, has to transform the patient or knowledge about the patient, and is done right the first time. If that's a little bit of struggle, go back to the Moodle wheel and look at that. So make sure everybody can see that. Where everybody labels something as green, no worries. At this point, where they label it as red, no worries. Where you have green and red, and have a discussion with the team that you can come up to a consensus of whether it's value add or not value add. Another mapping exercise that we like to teach is called the spaghetti diagram map. It's a really good way to show a bird's eye view of a process. I have a couple of examples here. It's really good when walking is having a lot or too much transportation. What you want to do is you want to um, make a schematic of the work area and then follow the entity and the workers around to see where, where they're going and how much time is being spent. It's a good representation. Again, it can evoke emotional response. 
if you can remove five minutes an hour from this process, that would be 40 minutes a day. You could probably get one more person in per day if you could do that. So it could go a long way in generating uh, the need to use U-flow shapes or move things closer together, move you know, copy machines closer or put a copy machine in an area, and those things can help. But I like this because it's a good visual of what's really going on within the, the uh, workspace. Step number three of Lean, eliminate the waste and allow the patient to flow through the value stream without interruption. So another one of the concepts that really, really bakes the noodle. Don't worry if patients about, I mean, about the workers being idle. It's okay for workers to be in idle. What you want to focus on is the entity flowing through. You want to make sure, in this case, if it's the patient, that the patient flows through without interruption. Okay, don't focus on how busy workers are. Focus on the thing that's flowing through. If you can make the thing flowing through or the person not idle, you'll find that the workers are now working on value-added activities instead of non-value-add. It will free up more time for them and allows people to spend more time on those things that ensure the patient or the entity flowing through is not interrupted. Once you know where the red dots are in your map, next you want to use what's called a 5Y process that we teach. It's a really easy way to drill down into the root cause. It's important to get to the root cause. If you try to solution something that's not all the way down, you will miss what the solution will miss a lot of times, what it needs to make it a permanent fix. Uh, although it's called a 5Y, generally two, three times you ask why you're going to solve it. I've actually seen a couple of times where it's gone as many as six. So five Y is just what they named this. It doesn't mean you have to have five Ys. We have an example here. Problem, uh, an item is missing from the exam room, caused wait time because someone had to go find something. Why was an item missing from the exam room? Someone forgot to restock. Why did someone forget to restock? The Kanban card was not pulled in time. Why was the Kanban card not pulled in time? The key person went on vacation and there's no backup. Why was someone not delegated, right? Because a new delegate was never appointed. So this is just one example. And by the way, you can have several of these, several of these for one problem on the map. Really what you want to get to is you want the team to get to the root cause or the couple of root causes that are the biggest impediments you know, to the workflow. So there's another tool called a fishbone developed by Ishikawa in the 1960s. This is another key core staple uh, uh, tool that's used in Lean, also used in Six Sigma. Uh, and it's the same as the 5Y, but it gives you a visual. The fish head that you see at the front, this is the problem statement. Then you use the five M's and P for the bones. You can see material, method, people, measurement, machine, and mother nature. And then use the 5Y process, and we get down to the root. Then those become little bones on the, on the fish bone. Again, it's a good visual. Same thing as the 5Y. I recommend using one or the other. wouldn't recommend using both. All right, next, another staple tool is called the FMEA, the Failure Modes and Effects Analysis. And this tool is used to help prioritize the work that the process improvement team is going to start on. You can't do everything at once. Some things you can do in parallel if there's different people working on it, but a lot of times it's the same people and resources needed, so you need to prioritize efforts. And this is a good tool to do that. So it starts with what is the input? Again, that's the five M's and the P. What can go wrong with the input? These are the things you identified on the red dots. What is the effect on the output? And you can have multiple effects for the same thing. For example, the effect on something missing from the exam room is it caused wait time for the patient. Okay. Another effect is it took someone off what they were doing to go find it. The severity is how bad is it from a scale of 1 to 10, where a 1 is not severe at all and a 10 would be extremely severe. Then the potential causes are your root causes from either your 5Ms, and, I mean from your uh, 5Y or from your... Um, fishbone, and then how often do those root causes occur? Very seldom would be a one. 
If it occurred every single time, it'd be a 10. And if it, if it occurred maybe 50% of the time, I'd use a 5. And then current controls. This is a little bit harder to understand, but do you have anything in place right now to ensure that it's caught before it gets to the next step of the process? If you can catch it every single time, a 1 goes in there. If you can never catch it 100% of the time, there's no controls in place, and it always gets to the next step before being caught and then rework happens, it's a 10. If it happens about 50% of the time, or it's caught 50%, then you would use a 5. This is an FMEA. You multiply the severity of the effect times how often it occurs times detection, and it gives you a risk priority number referred to as an RPN. Here's an example of one that we used out of a workshop. You can see here there was an RPN that was 1,000. So that would be the one that you would go want to go after first okay, in this one. We also teach something called a risk priority matrix in that you have on the right axis the RPN number and on the left would be time. You may find that there are some things that okay, may not have the highest RPN number, maybe it's a six or 700, but the time to fix it is very quick, so you may want to prioritize those first. So the FMEA is just a starting point. You've got to look at it from other perspectives to make a decision on which, which one you're going to go after first. Once that's done, now you want to put in waste elimination strategies. How are you going to fix these root causes? Okay. First, you always want to eliminate. Anytime you can eliminate something, please do so. That's the best way. If you know it's non-value add, it doesn't align with technology, we're still doing it, nobody's using this report, then just stop. Eliminate it. Second is to automate. Anytime you can take a human being out of it, automate. You can remove error and you can auto-populate. I always like to think of Amazon.com. You think about ordering through that, they have pretty much eliminated having to enter addresses and your credit card every time, they've eliminated all that activity. So anytime you can do that, that's a win. And then third is you want to simplify, right? Like reduce handoffs, co-locate things. I've got several here. I've highlighted Pokeyoke and 5S because I'm going to focus on those for this workshop. If we, if we were doing this in a workshop, we would go all these in detail, but for today I'm just going to pick on a couple. Pokeyoke, which means mistake proof, uh, it's a Japanese term, means, means mistake proof, is an approach to eliminate the probability of an error. Uh, here's a few examples, drop down menus so people can't make typos. Color coding items together can kind of speed it up, especially if it's an area where there's lots of, of wires that need to go together. If you color code, you know these two colors go together. Manual processes automated, again think Amazon. If you just take a manual process and make a manual process on your laptop, that's called manumation and that does no good. Right? All you're doing is making something manual in paper and making it manual on the computer. Always try to auto-populate and remove work when you, when you go to an automated process. Electronic sensors, barcoding, collision detection systems are cool. I always like a uh, correct position setting tape if something needs to be moved but be in the same spot every day. You can put markers down so you know where it goes. Barriers, uh, computerized physician ordering systems, plug protectors, and there's, there's many more that you can have. But anytime you can take out human error by using one of the yoke, it's a win. 5S is another way to uh, eliminate waste, and it's how you organize a work area. You want to start with sort, which means you want to remove everything out of that workspace that's not needed. Get it out. Then you want to sort everything into categories okay, that make sense being placed in this particular area and that's in the area. You want to store things, which means you store it in a drawer or someplace where it's always going to be, and you want to label it. Okay. Shine means you keep it tidy and keep everything in its place. And then standardize means you want every single workspace that's the same as that one to always be the same. So as a person goes from one workspace to another, they don't have to relook for something. They know where it's at. Here's a few examples. You can see the before and after, uh, how they've organized things. You can see the difference in finding something in the top left up here. Right? Finding that would be really hard, finding something where this is labeled and it's easier. I like the styrofoam inserts. I've seen that used many times and ensures that things are always in the right place. Obsolete files always get rid of things that are obsolete. And this before and after at the bottom left, I really like it. They use clear visuals. If you don't use clear visuals, you need to have some kind of a label on the outside so that people know what things are on the inside. Okay. Finally, you want to map what we call the 2B process. Once the team has determined 
which red dots to go after, the solutions are going to go after. Now you want to show what is this process going to look like when it's done. All right, up to this point, everything is still on paper. You need to understand this. Everything we've done so far, although it may seem hard, was the easy part. The next part is where it becomes more difficult to get it implemented. Step four, implement the solution and let the patient pull value through the workflow. Okay, first I'm going to talk a little bit about pull. Uh, pull is a fundamental concept in lean, but really difficult to understand in healthcare when compared to working in a factory or grocery store. So what it means is it's a signal that means that the next step in the process is now ready for the entity flowing through. Okay? And that a patient's not moved to the next step until all the resources and the workers are ready. Okay? Don't push and have them wait again. All right? No one from an upstream step moves the entity to the next step until the next step is ready for it. And there should be a signal that shows when it's ready. I always think of it like this for healthcare. The clinic is going to pull the patient through, and the patient is going to pull the supplies that are needed, and what's needed in that clinic. One of my favorite slides. Uh, at this point, it's all about change management. I can't tell you how many times in my career I've seen organizations say, we're too busy to put on the square wheels, I mean the round wheels, and so they just keep pulling and trudging through on a day-to-day -day basis. So now it's all about change management. What's important about change management to understand is that change management is individually felt. And a lot of times we say we're going to have an organizational change. No. Your change is always felt individually. Each person feels it differently. For example, if you look at the stadium here, the one on the left, for some that's a really positive change. Okay? For others, they could feel a sense of loss. Right? And I have to drive further. It's going to cost me more. And so for them, it's a loss. So change, when you're going to put your process in place, you're going to make changes, keep that in mind. You need to understand that from each person's perspective. It's what's in it for me. And so you need to look at it that way so you can help get them through the change. We use this adoption curve. I know if you go with an internet search, you're going to find those five or six, sometimes different levels. We've narrowed it down to three. We use pioneers, settlers, and dinosaurs. The pioneers are those who have been asking for the change for a long time, and they're ready. They're ready before you start. It's like, let's go. Let's put it in the place. The settlers are the majority, and they're usually waiting to see how the wind is going to blow. Is this really going to stick? Is it really something that's going to work? I just want to wait and watch. I want to see what happens. And then finally, the dinosaurs are those who, no matter what, are not going to change. Okay? The huge mistake that process improvement practitioners make is they spend time with the dinosaurs. Don't spend time with the dinosaurs. Work with the majority. Try to get the pioneers to help you bring the settlers over to their side. Dinosaurs will be left as a dinosaur. And you can worry about that later. But get the settlers in. We recommend Cotter's Eight Steps for Change. Uh, he actually has a book called My Iceberg is Melting. Actually, uh, his professor Cotter has many books out there. He's, he's the icon for change management, in my opinion. We follow these steps. First, create a sense of urgency. You should have been doing that with your first uh, transparent artifacts that you put together. Your map is very important for that. You should have a business case to show the difference between my as-is and my to-be map. Form a guiding coalition. It's important to have the champion on board and the C-suite, but also don't forget those pioneers. There can be people at the lower levels of the hierarchy that have the ear of other people above them and other people in their, in their peers. Find out who they are and get them to help you move your project along and gain consensus, get those settlers over to where the pioneers are. Create a vision for the future. This vision is not a vision for your company or a mission statement. It, the vision is your 2D map, your 2B case. This is what is going, the customers want to see. This is what's going to happen to this clinic. This is what the end result is going to be. Communicate that vision often as many ways as you can. We use newsletters. Uh, you can use email. You can use meetings. Make sure it's cascaded down. Update meetings. Just any way you can communicate that vision. Poster boards work real well. Empower action. This is for the C-suite. If you're not going to empower people to make the change, please don't start the project in the first place. Make sure the employees have the empowerment to go in and make the change. Create short-term wins. Again, we talked about the priority matrix. 
I think it's more important. Get that quick win. It may only be an RPN of 500, but I can do it you know, in two weeks. That's going to help keep your guiding coalition motivated when they say, hey, this works. So create those short-term wins when you first start. You're going to find there are big problems that are going to take six months to a year to fix. Put those into play, but also get those short-term wins to keep the guiding coalition motivated. Don't let up. If the project team does not bird dog this, it's, it's not going to happen. Project team, I mean the project leader and the champion have to make sure that it keeps moving. Make it stick. Research has shown that it takes about 90 days for a process change to stick on the average. So don't just finish a project and walk away. You've got to stay with it and make sure that it sticks. Five, maintain the gain and pursue perfection. This is the final step. Always track the before and the after. I'm showing a control chart here. This is a Six Sigma tool that we that we use. But it doesn't matter. Use a bar chart. Use a line chart. Just make sure that you track before and after so you can show the value of the change. If you don't do that, you will have trouble in the future with other process improvements to get that guiding coalition. Show them that it worked. Keep track record of it. Monitor it. And that will go a long way for this project, sticking in for future processes and projects. Monitor and close. Pursue perfection. Uh, go back and review the charter. Do you need to make tougher targets? Right? Can you change that? Maybe we had a 50% change, but we want another 50 on top of that. Uh, are there additional waste things that we identified, red dots that we can continue to remove? Again, it takes about 90 days for your change to stick. Only the champion can close the project. Right? They have to sign it off. And then you may want to monitor some of your key factors going forward. All right. In conclusion, I have a little drawing here that helps uh, individuals remember what we just went through. Always define value from the patient's perspective. Don't forget the charter, right? Then map and identify wastes. These are this is the Moodle wheel, the eight wastes. A waste is anything that impedes what the voice of the customer or the voice of the business want. Then you want to remove that waste so that the entity, in this case the patient, flows through without interruption. Again, at this point, everything's on paper. Implement the solution. We recommend Cotter's eight steps. Allow the entity to pull value through. The clinic is going to pull the patient. The patient pulls the supplies. And then pursue perfection. Don't forget to continue with your 5S. Make sure that that's being um, periodically updated and maintained. And go back and see if there's other red dots that you can remove. Why lean? Again, you want to optimize your processes with your technology and with the people's knowledge, skills, and abilities. If it's left out, it will result in problem knowledge, workarounds, uh, delay for the patient flowing through. Uh, so always, always think lean. Uh, if you want more, we do have a Lean Fundamentals workshop for healthcare coming up in July. If you're interested in that, just give me a, you see my email is here, uh, or get with the, um, a moderator also have the website listed here as well. And that's it. So now, Sean, can we open up for uh, questions and answers? We can. At this time, you can submit questions using the question panel located near the bottom of the control panel. Uh, we'll take some time to answer as many questions as we can. And we're just going to take one minute for the questions to come in through the queue. We already had a couple questions come in, Jerry. So the first one I do. is you mentioned, you mentioned that lean can fit into other methodologies, such as Six Sigma or PDCA. Can you explain what you mean by this? Yes, that's a good question. So what I mean by that is that um, the other methodologies can serve as a framework. For example, DMAIC, which is traditional Six Sigma is a framework. And within that framework, there's a toolkit that you can pull from. You can easily put lean within the DMAIC framework. Define is the same in Six Sigma. It's measure the as-is state. Use a lot of data in Six Sigma where measuring the current state and lean. You just do mapping, use different tools. But as far as aligning it, they align very well. So you could deploy both at the same time. That's what we've done here is deploy both at the same time. Same with PDCA. It's a framework. So your plan would be all the things that you're going to do on paper, all the way from your first phase to your third. Your do 
would be the fourth phase where you're going to implement the solution and pull value. And then your fifth would be your act where you're looking to pursue perfection and see what else you can do. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and several times you brought up that there was a workshop coming in July. Um, how, can we, how can the listeners get more information on the specifics? Um, okay, so the workshop is in July, uh, and it's going to be what you saw today, but in detail. Uh, the attendees will have an opportunity to practice using these. 50% uh, plus of the workshop is exercises where they bring in real issues to work on for their area and then have an opportunity to practice using those. It's on July 26th, 27th, and 28th here in Dallas at the Omni Hotel. Perfect. Would you mind going back a couple of slides and just having that um you have the link to it. I just want to make sure everybody is able to jot it down. And we will make sure to send this link out to everybody um, with the recording and the handout within two business days. OK, can you see that? I'll just leave it there while I'm answering questions. Oops. Um, yeah, that's so one of the questions that we had um, in here was, can you use a practical example? Yes, I will use one that we worked on in a workshop. I won't give the client's name uh, just because of proprietary reasons. But uh, we worked with an oncology group, and uh, they had an issue with getting people in chairs. Uh, they were getting like 14 a day, uh, and they had issues with sometimes the chemo would go to waste. Uh, people were sitting there for eight and a half hours. We measured eight and a half hours. And they brought in their, their um, pharmacist, two pharmacists, um, providers, nurses, and they mapped out the process and realized where the problem was. They actually called the scheduler in and they redesigned the process there on the fly and realized they could go down from eight and a half hours to two and a half right there. So they made the changes right in the class. It was kind of cool to watch. Uh, but then again, they followed the process, identified what was non-value add, what was going on, where the wait times were, and did some root cause analysis on those wait times to figure out why there was so much. Uh, and they resolved it. They did that actually in the class. It was kind of cool. Watch that. All right, let me look at some more questions. Let me minimize this real quick. Let me put the questions on here. Okay, I'm not seeing the question, Sean. I'm looking um, I have another one that came in. Okay. Um, can you elaborate on the, is it Kano or is it K-A-N-O model? Um, maybe you covered it, but I missed it. And what is the consequence of missing what you referred to as a basic need? And can you okay. give a real example? So the Kano is a, it's a process improvement tool uh, that ensures that something is not missed, especially the needs and those basic needs are things that the patient or the customer of a process expect to be there without having to ask for it right so they're not going to so say I want this for example and when I look at um, in healthcare it was one of them that came up in the workshops was they not going to ask that their bill be right that the claim is right and that it's coded right they're, they're going to expect it to be right and when they receive the bill in the mail they expect it to be what they what they thought it was going to be. When there are surprises, that's a basic need that is violated. They could have had a great visit, but if their bill becomes a problem, they may move on to another provider because I'm having trouble with my bill because this basic need is something I wasn't going to ask for. I expected it to be there, but I haven't asked for it, and it's not there, so I'm dissatisfied. So that's a basic, and that's what the Kano model does. You brainstorm basic. What they're asking for is what's called expected. It's a little bit easier. And then the wow factor is, hey, we have a new technology here that is really going to wow these, these customers. They can actually go on and they can schedule online without having to call someone. They can go in here and, and they can do something or appointment or leave a note, right, those kind of things. Eventually, the wow factors become um, basic factors over time. Keep that in mind. Do you see any more questions? There's, yeah, there's just a couple more. Um, one is, in healthcare, can the same methodology be applied to clinical processes rather than just workflow or patient satisfaction? Yes. In a clinical process, for example, 
you want to think about the perspective from the patient, what's happening to them in the workflow, if it's like a clinic, and you want to make sure that you minimize the interruption of that flow for the patient. You would follow the same tools, the same methodology, uh, and then you just apply a different entity. You can use the same thing if you were doing for, for example, if you wanted to um, um, map out your hiring process, which we've done before with a clinic, is you map out the hiring process from the point of um, recruitment all the way through retirement, right? So you could map that out. In that case, it would be the employee that would be flowing through, but the tools would be the same, but the artifacts that you pull out of it would, would change based on each scenario. Um, we have a couple more. Could you give a little more information about the poll concept? I didn't capture that. What was that again? The question was, could you give a little more information about the poll concept? Oh, the okay, poll concept. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, the yes. poll concept. Poll. Poll is a concept that uses a signal to illustrate that the thing flowing through can now move to the next step of the process, which means that the next step, all the workers and resources are ready. You don't want to push someone from one area to just go wait in another area because there's no value being added during that wait time. You want to see where they're waiting. So you want to make sure in your value stream, you want to know where those constraints are, and you want to figure out what can we do to minimize those wait times and show a signal. Another way is you would use a signal for your supplies. So if you have supplies you're going to order, you would have a Kanban card or some kind of a signal that would illustrate, hey, we only have 10 of these left. It's now time to order, right? So that's a Kanban card. So it works whether with the entity flowing through or whether your supplies that you're using. Great, and those are our questions. All right. And we're also out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and thank you, Jerry, for your time today. And as a reminder, we will you will receive a follow-up email that includes this presentation and a link to the recording within two business days. Also, uh, please take the brief survey when you log off the webinar to help us learn more about what was affected and where we can improve uh, for next webinar. At this, at this time, the webcast has ended, and we thank you for attending and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.